Thank you, Claire. So I should uh, start by saying that I'm not a psychiatrist, but I do want to talk to you tonight about psychiatry, in particular about what I see as a real revolution that's happening in this field. But to put that in context, I want to first uh, consider how other branches of medicine work. So say you've had some chronic abdominal distress. So off you go to the doctor to see if they can find out what's wrong with you. They'll run all kinds of tests. They do blood tests, allergy tests, maybe uh, an unwelcome colonoscopy, uh, biopsies, all sorts of things. And hopefully, at the end of that, they'll come back to you and tell you a diagnosis. So they may tell you you have Crohn's disease, or ulcerative colitis, or colon cancer, heaven forbid, uh, or some other of a, a range of discrete conditions. And knowing what that condition is will determine your treatment. Okay? These are very different conditions with different underlying causes that happen to share similar symptoms. So what you want to know is the cause. That's why you went to the doctor in the first place. Now, in the event that they can't identify a cause, you'll probably be given a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. And really, irritable bowel syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. What it really means is, we don't know what's wrong with you. Okay? But your symptoms look kind of like that group of patients over there. We don't know what's wrong with them either. Okay? But for the moment, until we know better, we'll just put you all in this one group together under this label. Okay? So it's a placeholder. Now, in psychiatry, all the diagnoses are like that. So labels like schizophrenia, or bipolar disorder, or autism, are all simply placeholders. So schiz schizophrenia might as well be called irritable brain syndrome. In fact, it really just lumps together patients who share a similar profile of symptoms, but it doesn't say anything about the underlying causes. And there's a very good reason for that, which is that we haven't known anything about the underlying causes. But that's changing, and it's changing not because uh, of advances in neuroscience where you might expect this information to come from, but from genetics. So we've known for as long as these disorders were described that they run in families. And twin studies and adoption studies provide overwhelming evidence that these are primarily genetic conditions. And what that means is they're caused by a change in a person's DNA. So some mutation in some gene in that person's uh, genome. Now, humans have about 25,000 different genes strung along our chromosomes. And each of those is basically a recipe or a code for a particular protein. So proteins are just little molecular machines or, or robots that each have different jobs to do in our cells, like, like collagen or hemoglobin or insulin or 24,997 other proteins. Okay? So the challenge when you have a genetic disease like that is to pinpoint the mutations responsible and find which genes are damaged in each patient. And until recently, we've been completely unable to do that for psychiatric conditions. But that is changing right now. And it's changing thanks to the development of new technologies for sequencing people's DNA. So, and, and, and I mean all their DNA, not just bits of it, their entire genome. So the, the sequencing of the first human genome took 10 years to complete, and it cost $100 million. And we can now sequence a person's entire genome in under a day for about $1,000. So that's really a game changer for medicine and for psychiatry in particular. And using that technology, scientists have now discovered hundreds of different mutations that can cause schizophrenia or autism or epilepsy or other psychiatric conditions. So within these broad placeholder categories, we can now start to recognize hundreds of distinct genetic conditions that all happen to manifest with similar symptoms. And the reason that there's so many of those is simply that it takes a lot of genes to build a human brain. The human brain is incredibly complex and exquisitely organized. There's hundreds of different cell types in thousands of different regions. Those all have to be distributed in the right way. They have to connect to each other in the right way for the entire brain to function properly. The amazing thing is that all that circuitry self-assembles as an embryo grows due to a developmental program that's encoded in the genome. But that program is vulnerable, and it's vulnerable because it requires thousands of different genes, the products of which control where cells migrate, where they project their nerves, which other neurons they connect to, even how those connections will change with use. And it's mutations in those kinds of genes, the ones that control brain development, that are now showing up in patients with, with mental illness. Now, we're just at the beginning of this process of finding these mutations, but we can already assign a discrete genetic cause to about 20% of cases of autism. 
which is a, a huge advance even from a, a few years ago, and about 10% of cases of schizophrenia, and again, those numbers are growing all the time. And those genetic diagnoses matter. It matters whether a person has a mutation in gene A or gene B or gene C. In the first instance, it can inform the prognosis. So it gives you some uh, reason that you can, you can um, tell what to expect in the future for a given patient. Secondly, it has a, a huge bearing on the risk to relatives, in particular future children of a couple who may have a, a, a child with mental illness already. And that can obviously directly inform uh, reproductive choices. And for some patients, right now, it already informs the treatment options. So just as an example, um, it turns out that some patients with autism or psychosis have mutations in metabolic enzymes. So those are proteins that, um, proteins that break down nutrients in a cell and they make useful stuff out of the bits that cells can use. So when those um, enzymes are mutated, you sometimes get psychiatric symptoms. And for some of those patients, knowing that allows you to treat that condition simply by dietary restrictions or supplements. And so what you can say is those, those kinds of, of conditions are very, very rare. Those are very rare causes of autism or psychosis, but that doesn't matter to those patients. Right? What matters is you found the cause and you've treated them. In fact, you've effectively cured them because you've treated the cause, not just the symptoms. Now, that said, most people with psychosis do not have a metabolic problem and would not respond to such treatments. But in fact, that's the point. That's the reason why it's so important to know the cause in each individual patient. In fact, sometimes uh, uh, medications for one condition will make another patient who has the same symptoms worse. That's the case for some people who have epilepsy due to particular mutations in a gene that encodes a protein called a sodium channel. Traditionally prescribed anticonvulsants will actually make those people worse. So those examples, I think, illustrate the potential for personalized medicine in psychiatry. But I should say that actually at the moment, for most of these rare disorders, there is no treatment. But knowing those genes, having found those genes, gives us an entry route to find out the underlying biology. So then we can bring all the tools of modern neuroscience to bear on the problem. We can use neuroimaging to define the, the brain pathology in particular genetic conditions. We can take skin cells from patients, transform them into nerve cells to study in a dish. And we can even, and, and this is where uh, groups like my own come in, make mutant mice that have exactly the same mutations as in humans to see how that affects how their brain develops, the connectivity in their brain, the way that their brain functions. And the hope is that all of that knowledge will help us develop new therapies that are based on a real understanding of what's going wrong in the brain in each patient. And for a field where no new drugs have been developed over 60 years, that is a real revolution. Thank you.